So take us into then what goes into making these chips. So today, the the challenge of making a chip is making transistors that are so small. Uh, it's not like you can take uh, your standard machine tools and dig out a hole in the silicon um, and, and, and fill it in with the materials you need. Um, transistors are made um, by etching um, holes into silicon and then putting, depositing certain metals or other material into the holes in the right amounts. That's a sort At of- incomprehensible scales of smallness. Yeah, because you explain it like that, I feel like, oh, that's a microscopic machine making little indents. Like, no, it's beyond our comprehension of small small scale. Yeah, That's right. And if you think of a, a silicon wafer, which is uh, the most wafers are 12 inches today are the, the most modern wafers. They've got, it depends on the size of the chip, but call it a couple dozen chips on them. And each of those chips will have a billion or two billion or five billion transistors. So on a wafer, you're talking uh, many billions of transistors. And, and you process them all, um, generally speaking, simultaneously. So when you do a process step, it's got to have an effect on all of the transistors at the same time. Uh, and your margin for error is limited. Uh, you can't have 5% or 10% or 20% of the transistors not a- operate the right way. And because you're, you've got transistors that are a couple nanometers or a couple dozen nanometers uh, in, in, um, in size, you don't have much scope for error. Um, So you've got to have these ultra-perfect manufacturing processes that can produce transistors by the tens and hundreds of billions uh, almost flawlessly. And that's, you know, understandably really hard to do, which is why there's uh, just a couple of companies that know how to make the machines to do it, that have the specialized materials and ultra-pure gases, and then that know how to actually put all these different pieces together, which is what the actual chip-making companies do um, in their fabs. And and because this is so hard, it's it's required this vast supply chain to actually make it possible. If, if it were easier, you could have more simple supply chains. But I, when I listen to people say, "Well, let's let's onshore the semiconductor supply chain to country X or country Y," I say, you know, "Do you have any idea what you're talking about and how hard uh, this is to do? Who do you know that can uh, that can produce you know 10 billion transistors uh, with 99% accuracy on a single silicon wafer? Well, there's one company in the world that can do step Y or step Z." Um, and that's the challenge today is doing it with perfect accuracy. So go a bit further into it, really uh, romanticize the ingenious complexity of the EUV machine. Could you try and take us into what it takes to do that at scale consistently? I'll just say one quick anecdote. Yoss explained what 10 nanometers was to me by saying, look at your fingernail for three seconds and that's 10 nanometers. So printing to that accuracy, like you said, um, with very low margins of error, hour on hour on hour, every day, without fail. It's, it's, again, it's up to technicians to understand how complex that is, but please, if you could explain that. Okay, so silicon wafer, we need the most pure silicon uh, you can imagine uh, to produce silicon wafer. Then- uh, which is which is sand at its core. That's right. Very very expensive, complicated sand. Um, so you you take this silicon wafer, um, and then there's a series of steps of uh, of lithography. And and the way you do lithography is you cover it with a chemical, the wafer with a chemical uh, that reacts um, to light or to ultraviolet light in this case. Um, and then you shine a pattern of light um, onto the wafer, um, and you need this pattern of light because uh, it will react with the chemicals in the exact pattern that you shine in it and then will let you carve out that pattern onto the chip. Um, so to use extreme ultraviolet light, which is the, the type of light that we now use for the most advanced chips, um, is complex because it's very, very hard to produce extreme ultraviolet light in the power uh, that we need to actually react with the chemical uh, and uh, on the wafer. And so to do this requires um, some of the most complicated machinery on earth. It requires the flattest mirror humans have ever made. It requires these extraordinary systems that hold um, hold uh, mirrors stable because any tiny movement in the mirror will uh, reflect the light in a different way. And it requires an ultra powerful laser to start. Um, and so the laser is made by a company called Trumpf in Germany, um, which then shoots a laser uh, and pulverizes a tiny ball of tin uh, to uh, several hundred thousand degrees Fahrenheit. Um, it does this uh, tens of thousands of times a second, 
and the numbers are just kind of mind-boggling. EUV is emitted, uh, this extreme ultraviolet light is emitted, it's collected by mirrors, and the mirrors themselves um, are, are, are complicated because uh, extreme ultraviolet light is sort of like an x-ray. It goes through most materials, like an x-ray does, it'll go through your body. Um, so you need specialized mirrors to actually reflect this type of light. And so the mirrors themselves are made of uh, layers of two different types of materials that are themselves a couple of atoms thick. So ev every piece of this machine is sort of an engineering marvel. Anyway, you collect the light, uh, you, you shine it, um, or you reflect it off of the pattern you want, eventually reflected uh, on the wafer, and then it's shined onto the wafer. And then you've got the reaction once the light hits the wafer with the chemicals you put down. Then you can... Um, so, and where the light hits the chemicals, they'll, uh, the chemicals will often um, will, will react one way where the light doesn't hit, the chemicals will be in their initial, um, initial state. And then you can use other chemicals to wash away um, the chemicals that weren't struck by light. And you'll be left with a pattern on the wafer. Um, and this pattern will be in the shape of certain of the transistors that you want. Then there's additional steps. You then etch um, holes into the... Um, into the wafer by using additional types of plasmas that you uh, expose the wafer to. And the plasma will react with the, the silicon, create the holes you need um, <coughs> in the silicon, and then you can wash this all away with different chemicals. And this process is repeated time after time. So there's often um, a thousand or two thousand steps in, <coughs> excuse me, um, in the creation of, a, of an individual wafer. I love the anecdote that you gave in the uh, Bloomberg uh, interview about how amazing we're talking about asml specifically here but i i suppose the same anecdote could be made for a lot of the sort of supreme chip manufacturers but just how so sophisticated the supply chain is and you mentioned there that piece of glass which is in itself a remarkable feat of engineering the flattest material ever created by human beings um, I just want to, again, emphasize its exponential shrink, its types of scale and accuracy that is, it boggles the human mind. It's so impossible to appreciate. That little anecdote you gave about the tin, it's, it, again, you know, um, I encourage anyone listening to go to the ASML website and try and look at their sort of animation of how this works, because it's impossible to appreciate until you are sort of just smacked in the face with it. Wait a minute, you have 10 thousand drops of tin actual tin going across a surface that a laser shoots into at perfect accuracy to then create all of these reactions of light that then prints onto a, a wafer that whilst may look thin has this stabilizing mechanism added underneath the mach the the temperature in the machine has to be kept to within a thousandth of one degree because any margin of error is going to fuck things up it's heavy machinery moving yet somehow you've stabilized everything it's crazy it's just unbelievable. But I think the, the craziest thing is it would be one thing to have this happen once or once a week or once a month, but it's operating constantly, 24 hours a day, mm -hmm. uh, flawlessly, or close to flawlessly. Um, and, and that, I think, is the, the, the really striking feature. And that's the difference between science and engineering, in, in my view, because scientists can do a cool experiment once or maybe a dozen times and prove the result what they want. But that's not what this is. This is about producing something that is going to be reliable enough that a company will be willing to spend... 150 million dollars on it and put it in their facility and bet their 20 billion dollar uh, fab on it uh, and so it's got to work almost all the time so yos says it's the most complex machine ever but i think he's quite biased in that biased. opinion since he was one of its creators <laughs> what do you think is the euv machine the most complex machine ever created by humans i it's it's certainly up there if if you look at just one of the key components so the laser that goes in the euv machine the laser alone has 457,000 component parts just for the laser. Um, Did you say 457,000? Yeah, yeah. So the numbers are wild. Um, yeah. And, and these aren't just sort of off the shelf parts. Many of the parts inside the laser are themselves engineering challenges. Um, so it's, it's sort of an onion in terms of you peel it and you find another engineering challenge um, below it. I think if you look at a 747 airliner, you'll find that I believe the number is 6 million components uh, in one of those. So the number of uh, the number of other uh, things you can compare EV to is very small. Maybe you compare it to a 747, which also operate basically flawlessly, uh, flying around the world. Uh, but that that must be just about um, just about it. I I struggle to think of anything else that's um, that's close. And if you look at the price tag of an EV machine, 150 million dollars plus or minus. 
um, you know, that gives you a sense of uh, just how much complexity we're talking about because there's not many things that uh, cost that much for a manufactured good that you can buy off the shelf. Fascinatingly enough as well, I think you also said this in the Bloomberg interview, they only sell a few hundred or thousand machines per year, um, right? Right. Yeah, I think it was a couple hundred um, last year. Uh, and obviously they're trying to ramp up to, to meet demand. Um, but the precision you need, it's, it's difficult to do mass, pre- mass production and precision like that simultaneously. I, th- I think the other factor is that if, if I were to give you a UV machine, you, know, you or I wouldn't have any clue what to do with it. There's not an on button you press and start producing. You need to train your personnel um, and, uh, and have your machine op- uh, kind of optimized to your specific um, factory. So that alone is, is a, a, an education process that companies need to um, sort it out. So it's not just can you produce enough machines, it's also can you train enough people to know how to use them effectively. Yeah, if we take a TSMC, I always get the acronym wrong, but the fab in Taiwan, ASML has full-time employees positioned there. They chartered a private flight with extremely complex transporting mechanisms to get it over there. The installation is itself a multi-million dollar process. The type of um, clean rooms that's required. Um, the, the whole thing is, uh, yeah, truly amazing. 